need to get one of those hats now. <laughs> My birthday's coming up in March, y'all, so <laughs> I'll take one of those hats. And I will use it every time I preach. I will put that hat on. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. Today's been good. He's so good. There we go. All right. Oh. I'm going to do my best to get through this morning. I have the, the privilege and the honor to, to speak to you all this morning about the glory of God. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I found myself this week in preparing. It was really, really hard, really hard. Um, not because I didn't have stuff to say about the glory, but because I would just find myself just in the glory, <laughs> find myself just like, oh no, like you're reading about God and his, his majesty and his splendor, and I would just start like weeping, and I would just start just laughing, and I just sit there and just like, what is, God, I got to get something on this page <laughs> to talk about, right, and just, but I would, I would find myself just getting lost in the majesty and the splendor of who he is, right, getting lost in his awe and his wonder, this God who created all things, who sustains all things. This God who the heavens can't contain him. The heavens are found within him. If the heavens contained him, then we have a little God. He is outside of it all. <laughs> this God who is other giving, other loving, unadulterated, perfect love. This God who gave up, or no, whereas humanity gave up immortality for intimacy. Or no, sorry, flip that around. I messed it up. Whereas humanity gave up intimacy to seek immortality, this God put aside his immortality to gain intimacy. He is a God of glory. Mm. And glory. What a word. What a word. It's simple. It's five, five letters. I had a G-L-O-R-O. -O. I was like, I was about to say four. I was like, it's four letters. Like, it's not four. It's not four. It's five letters. It's five letters. Glory. But the weight of it, the weight of the glory. <laughs> I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm like two minutes into this message, and I'm <laughs> count, counting on my fingers, y'all. Jesus, the weight of his glory. <laughs> oh, Siri just said, I don't see glory in your contacts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> oh, to be crushed by his glory. Mm. Jesus. So we get, to, we get to dive into his glory this morning. My, my heart for this morning, it's probably that we don't make it through this, that we just get raptured and lost in the glory and we're just laid out on our faces. That would be amazing. Because um, there comes a point, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there comes a point with the glory where it's, words don't do it justice. Words don't do the glory justice. That was the hardest thing in preparing for this message. I'm like, all right, my, my two questions that I want to, like, I ask for, like, okay, the glory. What is the glory, and what does it look like? And so what's the first thing I do? I go to Google. I'm like, what is the glory? <laughs> Tell me what is the glory of God, Google. Let me know. I need the answer. And this is the answer. The most common answer that was given was, it's the manifestation of God's presence. And I was like, that's weak. That's lacking. I feel like there's so much more to the glory than just that. There's something more on this than just the manifestation of God's presence. I love that. I'm all about that. But there's more. There's more to the glory. In the Hebrew, the word is kabod. And it means like weighty, 
heaviness, praise, honor. There's a weighty presence to the glory. In the Greek, it is doxa, which means to give praise or honor. Um, it means, uh, it has a wide application, but everything it's always used for is good. Dignity, glory, honor, praise, worship. Now, I stumbled upon, one thing I love doing is I love seeing what other people define things. And so I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, give me quotes on the glory. And I, if I, could, blah, blah. I stumbled on this one, and I was like this. This is it. What is the glory of God? It is who God is. It is the essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, the atmosphere of his presence. It's by Rick Warren. I was like, whoo, cool. Isn't it awesome when you stumble upon things and you're like, I don't agree with everything you preach, but dang, all right, you got that one down. I'm, I'm taking that definition. That's mine now. The essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, the atmosphere of his presence. The glory. So we're going to start off in Exodus 33. Y'all, I love this book. This book is so good. It's so book good. It's, it's this, I'm rabbit trailing right here, y'all. It is this collection of, of poetry and history and prophecy and the fulfillments of prophecies. And it's all contained in just like 66 books. And it's just like the weight, the power behind it. And this is the beauty, the beauty of it. I remember years ago having... Um, there's a pastor, a good friend of mine, his name is Jake Veach. He's now, he was a pastor at Bethel. Now he's uh, pastors a church in Ohio. And he gets up in front of our second year class. I was a student at the time. And he has a Bible. And he goes, this is not the word of God. And plumps it down. And the whole class is like, what? How dare you? You know? And it's like, it's a collection of books. But when you read it with the Holy Spirit, and he breathes on it, and he speaks it to you, it becomes living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. You can, the world can read this book and get the head knowledge out of it, but when you read it, it becomes the word of God. When you read it with the Holy Spirit, it becomes the word of God. I love it, and I, I've been challenging myself, because we're going we're gonna to start off in the Old Testament here. I've been challenging myself with the Old Testament has just as much glory on it as the New Testament. Not the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant, right? The, the New Covenant has a greater glory than the Old Covenant. But the Old Testament, Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. He said, you searched the scriptures concerning me. What scriptures were they using? All they had was the Torah and the prophets. All they had was the Old Testament. On the road to Emmaus, when he encounters the disciples, he says, <laughs> they're, they're like, don't you know what's happening? And and it says that he scolds them for not knowing the prophets. And then he, um, basically, he unravels. He says, he be beginning with Moses and the prophets, he teaches them everything concerning himself. How often are we using the Old Testament to preach Jesus? But that's what Jesus did. He used the Old Testament to preach about himself. And so, <laughs> Paul hadn't written his letters yet, y'all. Uh, the Gospels hadn't been written so I've been challenging myself with this and, and going back. And so we're going to start with in Exodus 33, and it's, we get Moses. Um, we'll probably start on, where is it, verse, like verse 17 or 18. But So at this point, so Moses, right? This is a guy who was a, was a Hebrew, gets adopted by Pharaoh, raises up there, kills a guy, flees out into the wilderness, is in the wilderness for a number of years, became a shepherd, and, and uh, all of a sudden one day he stumbles upon a burning bush that isn't burning, but it's on fire, and he's like, what, the, what is happening? This is holy ground, and he talks to God. God says, hey, you're going to go free my people. So he goes back, 
we see God move countless, right? I mean, like, we have the plagues. We have the, um, the staff turning into a snake. We see, we see a cloud by day and fire by night. He sees the Red Sea part. He walks through it. He sees manna being delivered. He sees all these things happen. He, they get to Mount Sinai. The Lord says, hey, you're going to come up here and you're going to meet with me. And they, the people say, it says that they saw this darkness come over the mountain. Moses goes up, meets with God for 40 days. Comes down. God's all mad because the people made a golden calf. And God's like, get your people in order, Moses. Like, I'm done with this. So Moses comes down. He cleans everything up. And then it says that he goes to the tent of meeting. So the tent of meeting was this camp, this tent that he had outside of camp that he would go to. And that was where the cloud by day would drop in there. And that's when they knew, okay, the presence of God is here. Moses would go commune with him. If the tent, if the cloud ever up and left, they knew picking up camp, we're going this way. We're following the cloud. And so he's in the tent of meetings. <clears throat> and, and God has said, hey, you go off this way. I'll send an angel with you. And Moses is like, no, we're not going anywhere without your presence. If you're not with us, we're not going. So God says, okay, I'll go with you. And then this is what Moses says. Verse 18, it's verse 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. He's in the cloud of his presence. He's seen all these signs and wonders and miracles. He was on Mount Sinai for 40 days communing with God. And he says, show me your glory. What's God's response, right? It's not, have, have, have your, I didn't know you were blind, Moses. <laughs> I wish I had known that before I chose you, right? It wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> It's not, it's not uh, you know, like, have you not been paying attention? Do you not see what I've been doing? No. His response is, okay, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you. See, I think Moses had a revelation. He had to understand. He's like, I've seen all these signs and wonders. I've seen all these things. And there's something more to the glory. There's something more. There's something that we haven't been seen yet. There's something that hasn't been revealed yet about your glory, Lord. Yes, those are manifestations of your glory, but what is the root of it? And the Lord says, it's my goodness. My goodness. I love this this quote. It says, um, God's glory, his tangible manifest presence will only be experienced to the degree we can recognize his sheer 15 billion volt goodness. Any area in which we have not seen that God is truly good in the deepest, fullest, richest, realistic sense of the word, we will miss his glory. Moses prayed, now show me your glory. And the scriptures tell us that it was the goodness of God that passed in front of him. God's glory is his goodness. His presence is goodness itself. Jesus Christ is pure pleasure incarnate. To miss his goodness is to experience a glory deficit. God is good. And I love this too. I love God's like, look, you can't even handle my face right now, so you're just going to see my back. (laughs) Right? I I was about to make, I will not go, I will not. Um, (laughs) You're going to see just the back of me. You can't see my face. And then he takes Moses and he's like, I'm going to hide you. I'm going to put you up on this rock and I'm going to hide you in a cleft. And I'm going to cover your face until it's the back of me and then you can see me. Like, he's like, look, you can, this is this little glimpse that you get of my goodness, because you can't handle it. Because if any man sees my face, he will surely die. And so Moses, after this, then we we get the the new Ten Commandments. We get, um, he comes down from the mountain and his face is glowing, freaks all the Israelites out, so he puts a veil on and says that every time from then on when he would go into the tent of meetings, he would remove the veil to speak to God, would come out of the tent go back to the people, and he would put the veil back down. This man was already living on the other side of the veil. Because he had a revelation of the goodness of God. Mm. Dear Lord. Okay, now we're going to move, move on to Solomon. Second Chronicles 5. So Solomon... 
right, the son of David. David had this, this desire to build God a temple. And, David, and God says, no, you're not going to do it, but your son is. So Solomon builds the temple. In 2 Chronicles 5, we see where they have brought the ark. There were things that David had set aside to bring into the Holy of Holies, right? The Ark of the Covenant, the Tent of Meetings, there's a, a few other things. And so we see at this point that the people, the Solomon and the priests and stuff, they've brought these things into the Tent of Meetings, and they come out, or into the, into the Holy of Holies. And this is what they do. I, I love this. Now, when the priest came out of the holy place, all the Levitical singers, Asaph, He-Man, He-Man, man, how awesome a name. I am He-Man. Uh, <laughs> their sons and kindred arrayed in fine linen and cymbals and harps, lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. It was the duty of the trumpeters and singers together to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, and when the song was raised, the trumpets and the cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord. And this is what they sang. For he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And what happens? The house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand or minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. What did they declare? He's good. And the glory filled the temple. Can you imagine being there and all of a sudden it's just like, poof, and you're just like, ew, boom, hit the ground. <laughs> right? Everybody just drops, 120 people, just do, 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 all laid out in the glory. Can't do anything. You can't minister. You're just undone. Undone in the presence. And the cool thing, the crazy thing, is the temple hadn't even been dedicated yet. It's like the next couple chapters. This was just, they put the ark in there, and they said, God, you're good. And God's like, that's right, I'm good. <laughs> Say it again. Um, <laughs> which they do, they do, hold on. <laughs> <That's what> they, <laughs> you, go, you move on to Second Chronicles 7, and now they've, they've prepared the sacrifices. And, and Solomon there's this prayer that Solomon dedicates the temple. And it says that fire falls from heaven, burns up the sacrifices, and the glory filled the temple. It took up its habitation in the, in the temple. And this was, it says when the people saw that, the people that are standing on the outside, they're watching all this happen in the temple. They see fire fall, burn it up, and it says they declare out, for he is good and his love endures forever. There's something about seeing the glory, and you're like, he's good. He's good. Whew. Now, we're going to jump forward in time to the book of John. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Another translation says, as the logos became flesh and pitched a tent among us, like a tent of meetings, he took on the glory. We have seen or beheld his glory, the glory of as of the Father's only one, full of grace and truth. Right? Hebrews 1, 3 says, He is the radiance of the Father's glory. The exact imprint of his nature. You want to know what the glory of God looks like? It looks like Jesus. We go from a time where God is saying, Moses, you can't look at my face or you're going to die. So now we're looking in the face of glory, face to face. Face to face with glory in the flesh. We beheld his goodness. And 
and we see, we see his glory manifest throughout all the Gospels, right? We see the signs and the wonders, the healings, the miracles. I love there's a, there's a story of the rich young ruler, right, who comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus' first response is, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Do the Ten Commandments. And he goes on to, you know, follow the Ten Commandments. And the rich young ruler misses it. He gets focused on, what did I need to do? And he missed Jesus saying, why do you call me good? I don't think he realized he was attracted to the glory on Jesus. And he's like, oh, you're good. And he's like, why do you call me good? Like, he's baiting him. Like, man, if he had just realized, oh, my gosh, you're good. The glory is on you little questions that make me wonder, like, oh, what would have happened? How would it have been different if we took it off of what do I need to do instead of just let me behold him who is good? There's a part of him that knew. It knew he's good. And Jesus baited him with the question, and he missed it. The next part, I, I love this story, is when, when Jesus is getting arrested. And um, I just love that part, right? Best part in the Bible. And then they, they come to him. And they say, are you him? And he says, I am. And everyone falls out. All the Roman soldiers, the disciples, everyone's laid down. Who knows how long they were laid out in the glory. But they, that's what happened. Just as when the glory filled the temple and the priests get laid out, Jesus is like, I am. And everyone's out. Could you imagine Jesus just waiting there? Just like, that's cool. It's fine. I'm, I got all the time in the world. Let's, you know, just, I'm just like, all right. <laughs> and so then we, we fast forward to the book of Acts, right? And Acts chapter 2. Let me, I'm going to, I'll read it. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them new ability. So they're in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit's like, the glory hits the room. The fire falls. And fills the new temple. Right? We are now the temple of God. We have been filled with this Holy Spirit. We've been filled with the glory. Hmm. Can you imagine what it was like in that room? The chaos. I mean, I'd be tripping right now if all of a sudden I saw fire floating above Donnie's head. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God! Ah! Oh! <laughs> like, I imagine, I can just picture being people laid out, people rolling around, speaking tongues, crying out. Like, what was it like? I mean, there was a roar that erupted in that room, but then people are stumbling out. And people are like, well, they're drunk. No, they just encountered the glory. They just got filled with the glory. They just got filled with a billion volts of glory. They didn't know how to contain it. They didn't know what to do with it. You look at, uh, you look at revivals throughout, throughout history. Um, the, the first great awakening, right? You have like John Wesley and you have George Whitfield and... Um, John Wesley, there was like crazy stuff happening in his meetings. And George Whitfield was like, I don't believe in this. This isn't, this isn't God. And then this stuff started happening at his meetings. And he was like, huh, all right, there's something on this. You know, there's something. Those guys, man, it is, you think of, you hear the stories of, they would preach in front of crowds of like 60 to 80,000 people. No microphones. No megaphones. Just preaching preaching the good news. You get into the, into the um, 
Oh, the second, the second Great Awakening. It, it started at the um, Cane Ridge in Kentucky, Cane Ridge Revival. And it was a field. 20,000 people show up in a field to talk about Jesus. And the presence hits, the glory falls in that place, the weighty glory. I'm going to read this, this account of it real quick. Hold on. So this was from, this was from a, a skeptic, did not believe God worked in this way. The noise was th- like that of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. I counted seven minutes, all preachers on stumps, others in wagons, and one standing on a tree which had in falling lodged against another. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy in the most piteous accents, while others were shouting most of the Voiceously, while witnessing these scenes, a peculiar, pecu- oh my gosh, peculiar, your, oh my dear Lord, a peculiar, strange sensation, such as I had never felt before, came over me. My heartbeat began to beat really fast. We're going to say big words, y'all, big words. My knees trembled, my lips quivered, and I felt as though I must fall to the ground. A supernatural power seemed to pervade the entire mass of mind that they're collected. I stepped up on a log where I could have a better view of the surging sea of humanity. The scene that had presented itself to my mind was indescribable. At one time, I saw at least 500 swept down in a moment as if a battery of a thousand guns had been opened upon them, and then immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. That's how the Second Great Awakening started. <sighs> you all have been in some pr- crazy meetings where I've watched the bodies hit the floor, but I haven't seen 500 get wiped out like a machine gun taking them out, right? Like, it's like, wait, what? Like, what is happening? There's so much to the glory. And it manifests and looks in so many different ways that can confuse us and offend us. <laughs> That's not what the glory is supposed to look like. Hmm. I think God enjoys the chaos. He's a God of order, but he's like, <laughs> let's just sprinkle a little fun in here. <sighs> and so now, now we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. We are now carriers of his glory. Do y'all know right now this is often, do you know that there's revival happening in Kentucky right now? Again, there's, there's a, a Christian college that they started chapel on Wednesday and it's still going. It's still happening. People are, are flying all in. Different colleges are coming over to partake and join in what's happening right now. God's on the move. The glory's, the glory's there, right? The glory is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. We can't escape it. Right? And so, so now where does the glory reside? Now, yes, technically his presence is everywhere, his glory is everywhere, but he's taken up residence within us. Within us resides the glory of God. Right? God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You carry his glory. Habakkuk. Two, four. We love this. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. It doesn't say that the earth will be filled with the glory because the earth is already filled with his glory. We can find his glory everywhere. We look in creation. We, look, we can see his glory everywhere. But it says it will be filled with the knowledge. That word is yada. was intimacy. An intimate experience with the glory. The world will be filled with an intimate experience with the glory. Jesus, we have now become the carriers of glory, right? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is not here or there, but it is within you. We see in Acts, again, with the, the spirit falls, and, and suddenly it's, it's 
Paul tells us that the Godhead was pleased to dwell in bodily form in Jesus. And then Jesus says, and I am in you. Now you are full in him. And Jesus says, give them my glory. You have glorified me, so now I give them my glory. And so now, here's the, here's the thing. Is how, do we, how do we practically engage with the glory, right? If the glory is within me. What does that mean? It means now that everywhere you go, people are encountering the glory of God in some degree or fashion. When you're, you're not just in a work meeting, you're bringing people into the glory. You're not just shopping for groceries, you're releasing the glory. You're not just parenting your kids, but you're raising up the next generation into the glory. Jesus, the glory, his goodness. I love his glory. I love his presence. I want everyone to be like uh, Brother Lawrence, just jacked up in the presence of God, realizing like I'm not going to do anything unless I'm aware of his presence, unless I'm aware of the glory that resides within me. Wouldn't that be amazing? if we had that revelation in every moment and every aspect of our day. That's what I strive for. Right? And, it, and it isn't a, God, I want more of your glory. There is, there's always more. There is a death, but you have been filled. It is, Lord, awaken me. Let me realize, give me the awareness to realize what you've already placed within me because that alone, I will spend eternity discovering the depths of his glory. Right? We're, we're called to may everything we do bring glory to God. Right, Do everything as if to the glory of God. And so for me, I'm going to give you my, my, I don't know what the word is. Um, how I, how I for myself engage with the glory. The easiest way. There's, there's so many different ways of diving into the word and, and contemplation and meditation and all, all sorts of things. But the easiest, and I think the simplest, and the one that's the most practical, if you've got to start somewhere, where do I start with how to engage in the glory? How do I get that yada, that intimate experience with the glory? It's through worship. Through worship, he inhabits the praises of his people. You begin to worship, you begin to adore, you begin to set all your affection, all your attention on him, and you can't help but pull on the glory that is within you and around you and everywhere. And that's when you see signs and wonderfuls and miracles. Everything, everything starts happening, not because we're trying to make it happen, but because we're so lost in the glory that it just happens. I love, I love. Bill Johnson has a quote of like, um, the signs and wonders like release the, release the glory. And I love that quote, but I think it's a circle because in the glory releases signs and wonders and miracles. And then all of a sudden that releases more glory. And then we're seeing more signs and wonders and miracles, which is releasing more glory. And it's this endless cycle. <sighs> Jesus, he's good. The glory is so good. It's here in this place. I don't know if you guys can feel it. I felt it the whole, the whole morning. I've been just here, Lord. I don't know how I made it through this message, y'all. Ha, and so this is what I want. This is how I want to end. I want to end with taking the practical step of we're just going to worship him. We're going to worship him. We're going to engage with the glory because it's already here. His presence, his presence fills this place 24-7, y'all. I'm in this building a lot. And it's always here, but even that, it's here because we're here. It's here because we brought it in, because we stood in the place. I've been, I loved Anthony when he preached a couple weeks ago, and he talked about like how he went to Bethel. And there is a thing, when you step onto Bethel's campus, you're like, whoa, what is up with this place? But it's because of the people. It's because the people have stewarded and hosted and put honor and reverence on the glory. And it is something that, that I have had the privilege and honor of walking with Ben and Tisha for years now. And that's what they do is they steward in the presence. They, they say, God, we want nothing more but your presence. We want to steward this glory. 
That's what Bethesda is about, is stewarding the presence of God so that we can, it can leak from this place and infect this city. Man, you read some of the old, I'm going over now, but you read some of the old like revival meetings, like Catherine Coleman or Mariah Woodworth Edder, and people are like going into trances and falling out in the glory like miles away. They're just, can you imagine, you're just, you're just walking to the grocery store and you're like, oh, boom, hit the ground and you're, you're out in the glory. Meeting Jesus for the first time because someone who stewards and hosts the glory so well a couple miles away is in town. Like, man, could you imagine? I want to hear the testimonies of people that were walking down Vancouver and get laid out in the glory. And then the Lord's like, yeah, you need to go to Bethesda. They're hosting it. Jesus. Can we get the worship team back up here? Hmm. Right, there's something, there's something about all of us together in one accord, worshiping him, that releases the glory, that causes us to all become aware of his glory, that brings that, that uh, we step into that kabod, right, that heavy, weighty glory where we're glued to the floor and drooling and just like, dear Lord, whatever you want, whatever you want, Lord, I'll do it for whatever you want because his glory is that good, because he is good, because you know I can trust him with anything because he's good, because I'm in the glory right now. And I'm convinced of his goodness. Do whatever you want to do. I sent her a list. I said, hey, we might end with worship. Here's some songs, but I, you got it. Whatever. Y'all, let's stand. Let's engage. If you got to go pick up your kids, go pick up your kids. But we're just going to take a couple moments, and we're just going to engage with the glory.